Test? Test, are we good? All right. Hey, what is up, guys? Welcome back. I hope you had a solid Halloween weekend. Uh, we're officially in November, and we're officially done with uh, daylight saving. So this is that, um, this is that time of year when, when things get really dark really soon. So I don't know. Some people like that. Some people don't. I personally kind of prefer it not to be so dark, uh, especially when we start WDD. Uh, but I guess it's OK. Um, I have a couple quick announcements real quick. Um, number one, grading will all be done uh, within the next week. So in case you're wondering, like, why are some things still not figured out, <coughs> we'll get it to you within the next week. But um, that brings me to my second thing, which is I hope that everyone here uh, can fill out your group project, um, your group project feedback forms. Because the sooner you get those in, the sooner we can get back your group project grades. So if you haven't done that already, please do. It helps us make sure that everything was fair for the group project things, because you know, there's some, there some things that we just don't know about when we see the final product. And I'm sure you guys can totally attest to that. Uh, and you could write a ton about it. And we want to hear about it, so that we can give as fair a grade as possible. Um, let's see. So we went over. Grades will be done by next week. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, please get those feedback forms in. Also, uh, next week is um, Veterans, Veterans Day, this, this day next week. Therefore, there won't be any class next week. This is something that we didn't fully uh, appreciate when we, were, when we were planning the class in the beginning, and it sort of surprised us. But that's OK, because you know, we can bounce back. Uh, we're just going to move everything back, and still everything will finish at the same time. Um, so you won't have to be doing anything during dead week for this. So don't worry about that. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you're getting out of the homework, because homework is still due at the same time, as though we were having class. Um, so that's still, that's still on track. Uh, but yeah, next week is, is uh, Veterans Day on this Tuesday. 11-11, um, so don't come to class. <coughs> All right, so did I cover everything? I think, I think those are the main announcements that I've got. Uh, today, we are going to continue with our talk of JavaScript, but in the form of something called jQuery. So jQuery is like sort of the interface of choice when it comes to doing things in JavaScript on the front end for, for applications. So you know, this class only covers the front end of, of web applications, of websites. So there's a front end, that which the user sees and interacts with, things like the buttons and the forms and stuff. And then there's the back end, which we don't talk about at all. But there are plenty of great resources here on campus where you can learn about that stuff, um, like the Ruby on Rails decal for one. Uh, but so jQuery is just you know, the, the tool of choice. And the motto for jQuery is write less and do more. Uh, we didn't go over things that you have to write in JavaScript in order to do things on the front end, uh, like, like looking for elements and then, and then doing things with those elements, because it's really verbose. And it's really sort of, um, you know, it's got a, a, you have to write a lot to do a little, like only a small thing, whereas jQuery uh, is a way that to, to solve that. Um, so we're going to try to learn it tonight. <coughs> uh, so real quick, I just want to go over some, some jargon that I've used, and maybe uh, some people who are just beginning this whole programming thing are still a little bit unclear, but everyone still remembers what, what functions are, right? Functions, um, you know, they take in zero or one, zero to or more inputs, and then they, they do some output or they do something. Um, and it's like a specified task. So that, that sounds all familiar. Um, interchangeably, you can say functions or you can say methods. Uh, so functions and methods are the same thing, and the process of calling a function or method is to basically use that function and, and basically apply it. Um, so I hope that's all clear. Uh, functions take in inputs, but another way of, of calling those inputs is arguments or, or parameters. Those are all, again, like it's all synonymous. Parameter, argument, input, it's all the same thing. But when I, when I talk fast, sometimes I'll just say, you know, it takes in this, this argument. Uh, and so you'll know what that, what that means. So. Um, I hope that's clear. Is there anything else that, that I've said or that you, want, that you want to know about for the definition of? Like if we just sort of say it real fast um, and you just, you're not sure what I mean. Maybe another one is um, API. Is anyone curious like what that, what that might mean? Or does everyone know about APIs? Just to be clear, like APIs, um, it stands for Application Programming Interface. And it's, it's essentially just that. It's just like an interface. Um, just like how your steering wheel and your gas pedals are an interface for driving your car. Obviously, like pushing your car 
uh, really sucks and it's very difficult. So thankfully, you know, there's an interface that makes it so much easier where you know, all you have to do is like just turn a wheel and press pedals, right? And that's the only interface you need to know about. You don't need to know about the complexity of the engine that's, that's, uh, that's going under it, unless that engine fails, but assume it doesn't. It's just, you know, it's working fine. All you have to know about is just, you know, the, the steering wheel and the pedals, and that's it. Likewise, um, in order to interface with sort of bigger things, uh, we have things called APIs, which make it really easy for us to use them to achieve bigger things on the other end. So when you hear things like, you know, the Facebook uh, graph API, what does that mean? Well, that means that you can have access to basically all of Facebook's you know, giant, um, giant connection graph of, of all those friends and all those connections and relationships with, with every single user on Facebook. But of course, you, know, you don't have to have all that locally on your machine. You can just query it. You can just ask it questions. Um, and, the, and the interface by which you ask it questions is the API. Much, much easier. Um, and you can, have, you can wield the power of all of Facebook, essentially. So that's, that's what an API is. Uh, likewise, you know, jQuery is an API uh, in that it's also an interface to do things in, with JavaScript um, that would traditionally be really long and verbose and um, not as intuitive when you look at the code, but this is much, much more clear. <coughs> so, uh, you know, uh, JavaScript slash jQuery is, is how you give behavior to your page. Um, and we can actually look at what jQuery is right now. Uh, so when I say jQuery is a library, written in JavaScript. What I mean by that is essentially it's just a big program that's written in JavaScript. Um, and here it actually is. So this right here is actually um, jQuery. It's a stable version of jQuery. And it's a really, really long JavaScript file, like really, really long. Um, and you, you might be wondering, like, well, good thing I don't have to read through all this, because you really don't. All you need to know is how to use it, really. Uh, and by, by using it, it takes a, a different kind of syntax than standard JavaScript. Uh, we're going to talk about like, how, how it looks syntactically. But um, essentially, you know, one guy said, like, doing stuff on, on the web front end is just not super great or easy in JavaScript. So I'm going to make something called jQuery, an interface for making that much easier and much more intuitive. And so that's what this is. And yeah, it is really long. Um, so in terms of behavior, this is sort of a general theme that happens like throughout this entire lecture, but like everything that I'm going to talk about is essentially just a reaction uh, up to something. So when we think about behavior on a web page, you know, when you click on a menu that isn't there, um, we typically expect some sort of reaction from the page, like poof, the menu is there, or, um, you know, or some loading icon happens uh, when you're trying to load a really heavy page. Something like that. Like we want, we want some sort of reaction to occur as a result of us doing something, whether it be clicking, scrolling, hovering over something. Uh, we, want, we just want something to happen. And so uh, that's, what that's what jQuery does. All it does is react to events. <coughs> so again, you might be thinking, wow, that's really intriguing. How should I go about uh, using that? And so there are two ways that you, that you can uh, put jQuery on your page and start developing with it. Uh, the first way is the... Um, uh, you, can, you can grab it from the internet. So somewhere online, of course, there is a copy of jQuery uh, sitting on someone's server. And all you have to do is just take it uh, and, and link to it. And this is actually one valid link right here. Um, it's hosted on code.jQuery.com. And then there's, there's um, a version of jQuery. And basically, you can put it on there. And so long as you have an internet connection, because of course, that's the only way you're going to access uh, this jQuery file, you can develop like this. Alternatively, uh, if you want to be able to develop offline, as in, you know, you don't need the internet to, to access this jQuery file, you can also take a copy of, of jQuery, which is basically the file I just showed you, um, and you can get a min, minified version. And you know it's minified because um, if you notice at the end there, it says .min.js, which basically means it's just sort of scrunched up so that it's, it's lighter um, in terms of file size. Um, and you can, you can also use that to develop. But, um, Typically, we recommend that by the time you're officially done with development, you take out that file so it's one less thing to, for the page to load, and you just um, use the online link, um, which makes sense, because the pe person using your website is already going to be online. So uh, it just, it's just increases your page uh, loading time if you have to load less. So uh, one quick error that I know that a lot of people are going to commit 
Uh, before, before you do that, and before you ask on Piazza, like, why is jQuery not working for me? I'm going to just catch it right now, like a, like a prophet. Uh, and so here it is. Be sure to not link your, your script.js before your jQuery. Um, and why would that be the case? Well, it, your script.js, if you're using jQuery things inside of it, um, is going to like reference jQuery stuff. But you know, the browser you know, does things sort of top down, right? So when it reads JavaScript, it'll say, like, I want jQuery stuff. But all your jQuery stuff is at the bottom. So it won't have known it by that time. And then you'll get a lot of reference errors, like trying to reference something that isn't quite there yet. So um, that's just one thing we have to sort of solve by, by linking them in the right order. So first you link jQuery, then your script.js. One thing to note that I just realized might not be um, super intuitive is that, yes, it's still script.js, not script.jQuery. So again, like I said, jQuery, JavaScript, jQuery is written in JavaScript. So um, it's not a totally separate file. It's still, it's still JavaScript. <coughs> Anyone have any questions about anything I've said? OK. Oh, question. She says one less thing to load if you link to it online. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So it's one thing to sort of query and like find it online uh, on a server, but it's another to have it be sort of part of your page, like an image is part of your page, or the text uh, in, in those files is a part of your page. So in that sense, um, depending on how powerful your server is, uh, it'll take longer. And more likely, code.jQuery is like, you know, more, more quick and snappy. But yeah. Um, so everything that I'm going to cover right now is officially on this website api.jquery.com. Uh, and essentially, what it is, and we can go to it right now, but it's literally like all the things that you can do in jQuery all on one really nice page. Um, this right here is called documentation. Documentation is basically the instruction manual. And typically, uh, it's pretty long for most things. Um, and jQuery is uh, kind of no exception. But um, documentation is basically what you should read if you want to learn, if you want to know how to do something. It's like in a way, the dictionary. Uh, it's something you just, you just look to because you want to you know how something is, is done uh, or what the standard is. And so you know, if I just go on something like dot fade in and I click on it, um, it just tells me like, everything that I would want to know about how to use this. Uh, it's, it says here um, that it takes in a couple arguments or a couple inputs like duration. Um, and there's even actually an example of how I would use dot fade in. <coughs> So yeah, everything I'm about to go over, it's going to be some subset, some part of, of this documentation. Um, so again, like this class is not going to be like, we're not going to go over everything you can do in jQuery. But you know, this is sort of uh, where you should look to if you, want to if you want to know how to do things. OK, so the whole key behind jQuery is that there's something called selectors. And it's actually really similar to something that you've already seen before in terms of CSS. In case you remember CSS selectors, you, know, you might say, hey, that sounds kind of familiar. And really, they are uh, more or less uh, very similar things. First thing you should note is that when you're using any kind of selector, when you want to select a particular element, uh, you have to use the dollar sign. So this is sort of jQuery's uh, kind of like um, trademark, where everything that, you, everything that you select is going to have a dollar sign in front of it, and then um, the selection text thereafter uh, in parentheses. <coughs> Uh, and that goes for even the very beginning, like in, in terms of using jQuery in the first place. So the way you, the, the way you, uh, your script.js would look if you're using totally jQuery is it'll look like this. It'll have document, dot ready, uh, and then, and then the function of everything you're going to run. Um, we're going to go over really what this means um, soon, but basically you can sort of see you can see the dollar sign. So we're we're asking the document when you're ready, then do all of these things. And by all of these things, we mean like every every sort of jQuery function that you'll write. Is that clear? Is that, is that good? This is the time of year when we also start to lose a lot of people because you know, they, they get overwhelmed uh, with all this stuff. Um, so I want to try to go slow, and I want to be thorough with, uh, with everything that's going on here. But um, essentially, sometimes like we'll actually, the way jQuery will do it is that um, if you didn't have this, um, all the things would run before the document is even, is even ready. So uh, we need to have this so that like, at the point 
in which the document is finished loading, that's an event. That's an event that says, hey, I'm finished loading, I'm ready, and because I'm ready, you can execute all the jQuery stuff on time. <coughs> um, so again, selectors. It's a really common theme throughout front-end web design, and it's still true. Basically, you know, I hope you see now that web pages are really just a bunch of, a bunch of HTML elements organized in a sort of tree-like structure where there's, there's sort of like roots, and then they branch off into smaller sub-elements. Uh, and basically, all you're trying to do is select certain things, and then, or maybe like a, a set of certain things, and just make them look good. You know how to make them look good already, because we went over CSS. But now we're going to see how you can apply behavior in the same way. Um, so in this case, here's how selectors look all the time. It always looks like dollar sign, parentheses, and then in quotes, and always in, or uh, for the most part, always in quotes, uh, you, have, you have the sort of selector that you want to use. So here's how it sort of maps over to stuff that you've already seen before. You know, in CSS, we have like, uh, you know, just paragraph tags. You can just put it within quotes. Same with classes and IDs. So nothing changes. Now we're going to see our first jQuery methods. And so we're going to start really simple, and we're going we're to talk about the really simple methods in jQuery uh, just to see what, what elements, what content do elements hold? So here are three of them. There's uh, .text, .html, and .val. Um, you might be wondering, why are there dots in front of all of these things? Um, and so this is sort of when we get into back to functions. Um, there's, there are some ways you can call functions in the way that we talked about last week was sort of you know function name, and then in parentheses you put in the arguments, uh, and then it should just spit out whatever, it, whatever you told, define the function to do. But another way of doing this um, uh, is calling these, these, these functions is, is to take whatever you're going to operate on and then put a dot, which signifies I'm going to call the following function on, on whatever I'm operating on. And then uh, that should also likewise spit out whatever uh, it's intended to do. So what do I mean by that? Well, here's, um, here's an example page right here. And we have, um, y y you can already sort of recognize this very simple structure at the top. Um, and if I were to get box, the ID's box.txt, what it would basically do is, it, is the selector would select you know, the whole box element, and then it would just return the text value. Right? So this is how you literally, this is how it looks syntactically, is like the, it's the um, jQuery selector dot the method, and then that would return hello world. And this can be really useful um, in terms of, of uh, if you want to see like, what's on your page at any given point. Um, a slight sort of difference to that is that you can do .html and not just get the text, but you actually get the entire HTML element uh, in, in entirety, which could also be useful at some point or another. Does this make sense to everyone? Is everyone sort of clear on this? OK. We're starting really slow, and then we'll, we'll like speed up a little bit more, because I know this, this might be kind of slow. But um, the same is true if you have input tags. So input tags in HTML. Uh, are the ones that do all those sort of forms that you've ever seen. So when you ever have like type your name in here, uh, it uses this HTML input tag. So how do you get the value of whatever someone put in there? Well, you have to do dot .val. Um, so if I were to do that on this, on this page, I would get whatever someone has put in there at that given point in time. So this is great for when you're doing like form validation and stuff. Like if you ever wonder, how did they know that I didn't put in a password that was more than six characters or something like that? You, they did a quick dot .val query and checked the length of that, um, and it's less than six characters. Questions? Anyone? Yeah. Sure. Um, so the dollar sign is essentially every time when you're selecting something, you just have to put a dollar sign on the outside. Um, it's really that simple. The reason that it's there is that the person who wrote jQuery had to think of, like, how can I sort of distinguish um, jQuery when I'm when I'm uh, looking through it and trying to interpret uh, what means what, they, they use a dollar sign. They just chose a dollar sign because it just wasn't used in JavaScript. So um, I think that's probably the best way I can explain it. Yeah? Um, I don't know if this is important, but can you kind of explain how the uh, input tag is made? Like, if you have an input for the box, mm -hmm. OK. It's like, like a submit or something of that nature. Sure, sure. So uh, we're actually going to 
I think, are we going to go over this? In the, yeah, we're going to go over this in the hands-on. So you'll actually, we're going to use more input tags. But um, that's a good point. So does it only get the value after you submitted it or not? Um, the, the truth is that like after you've typed um, something in and then the point at which you call that function, that point in time is what it will return. So if you change it and you don't call it after that, it won't change. It's just so, kind of like a snapshot, like what, what was it at that point of time, then return it. Yep. OK, I'm going to move on. <coughs> all right, so likewise, all three of those, those methods, those functions that I just showed you, um, so far you've seen how they can get content. How like if you want to know what's between, what's with the content in that element, um, you know, that's, that's what it is. But you can also actually use all these to set content, so as opposed to just reading it and seeing what it is, you can actually sort of erase it and rewrite it to something else. And so that's what this does here. So if, if instead in the, in the box I wanted to put something else, uh, I, could do, I could just do dot text and put something else. So in the case of, um, I don't know, if, like, if someone completed a survey and you're, you're writing an app for a survey and someone, someone completed that survey uh, and you want to thank them for, for, their, you know, for their time and patience, then you just uh, you would dot text and then you would rewrite a different message in a certain point. That's one way you could do it. <coughs> okay, so um, we just went over um, ways that you can get and set content. Now we're going to go over some, some of the effects that you can do, just a small subset of the effects. Um, and the first of which is really, is, is really quite simple. It's just dot .show. So um, the thing is that on any given page that you're using, um, if you find that like certain things pop up, anything from being on Facebook and, and clicking on a photo and then something uh, and then like the photo suddenly pops up. The thing is that it was actually there the entire time for the most part. In most cases, it was actually there uh, when the page loaded. But the reason that you didn't see it is that it was displaying none, right? So the, the, the photo uh, modal, aka the carousel of images, um, is, it was actually there the entire time, but when the page loaded, it was at display none. And then you think, why, why does it at display none? Because you don't want to show it to people until they click on it, right? So that you want to react to that event, and only then do you show uh, what's there, and so this is this is where show comes exactly in there. Like it was it was there. On, it's displaying none to begin with, but right when you click on a certain thing, you want to show something else. Um, and the syntax is really similar to to things we've seen before. It's just um, it's just uh, upon clicking something, we fire this this function. Um, let me see. So I think I sort of went uh, jumped ahead a little bit, and I I sort of did something. Here, where notice how there's a dot click. Um, again, like since jQuery only uh, reacts to page events, one of the page events, of course, could be click. And so, if let's suppose there's a button on the page, uh, and and you wanted to show the pop-up, of course, when you click the button, or show something when you click the button. There's, of course, should be a function that is is whose sole purpose is just to, like listen for clicks or just wait for clicks and and. And when that particu particular thing that you're targeting is clicked, it should do something. That's essentially what this is. We're just waiting um, for, for a click to occur. And when it does, we do whatever is in the body of that function. This is um, essentially all of jQuery right here. It's just like we're, we're listening to various, for various events, whether they be clicks or scrolling or hovering or anything you can do on a web page. We're just waiting for those. And when they happen, we react to them by doing some kind of effect or something like that. So that's going to be a general theme, and that's really not going to change throughout the rest of this class. Um, that's all this is. And of course, if there's a show, there should be a hide too. So you know, when you're done looking, when you click the X and you want to close out of it, you should probably dot hide. A really similar sort of uh, set of methods that do the same thing are fade in and fade out for the more aesthetic look. So instead of just immediately showing up and then like immediately disappearing just as fast, um, we actually have something called fade in and fade out, which takes in an argument or takes in an input. Uh, and that input is, um, well, actually, we, saw it, we opened it earlier, and we saw that it was duration. In other words, how long it's going to take to fade out. This, uh, this argument is going to be in milliseconds. So uh, you know, 1,000 milliseconds is in one second. So if you wanted to fade out something over the course of two seconds, you know, you'd put in 2,000. Um, but essentially, it's nice and super customizable, so just, how, just however you like it. Um, and yeah, essentially hide and show, but, but you can adjust the, how, much, how long it takes to come in and out. Uh, and this one's also really super useful. So like we said earlier, as like 
best practices. If you can do it in CSS, please do. So um, this goes for sort of all the transforms that we talked about too. Like if you want to do a, a transform, there are ways you can do it in jQuery, but I think it's probably best and maybe maybe most intuitive if you just added CSS elements to make that happen instead. One way you can go about doing that is if you want to add just sort of one property or just one line uh, or just a few, you can use .css. So can anyone explain what happens uh, in this function here? Background right, but what what has to cause that? Clicking on, Clicking on the background? Right, on the That's right. Yeah. So clicking on some element with the ID Tumblr, maybe it's a button uh, that that says Tumblr, would would only change the background uh, of the body, so of the entire page, from whatever it was to that's actually Tumblr blue right there. So just as a fun fact. Uh, but yeah, that's essentially what this would do, and. Um, I hope this, this uh, syntax is, is sort of clear, or clearer by now. If you want to like, hear it in English, it's basically, when someone clicks on the element with ID Tumblr, then I'm going to change the background of the body to be this blue, this hex color. So translating from jQuery to, to English, um, that's directly what it is, more or less. And I, I, soon everyone will be able to read it like that too. Uh, but I, I know it's sort of like out of order, but that's sort of the best order in which the computer can understand it. But yeah, that's, that's uh, what it's essentially saying. <coughs> this is when you want to add sort of more, more CSS properties, so as opposed to just one line at a time like we saw with .css. You can actually add entire CSS classes. So this is like super powerful and super really, really um, commonly used, especially if you're trying to do any kind of um, animations or anything like that. This is what you want to use. So, Essentially, in your CSS, you basically have predefined classes that you wrote there and that are already, um, they already have all the elements that you, would, that you would know you'd want. And then upon you know, something happening, like I said, like a click or a scroll or a hover, um, depending on which function you use, you add that class to that element. Um, so uh, you can actually use this for a ton of things like, like animations, like if you already have like all the linear transforms things defined, but you want it to start some point, um, you can basically add class upon some event and then it'll move it there. So yeah, essentially you can add classes that you predefine and it's super helpful and super, um, it's super commonly used. And so I didn't have time to make a JS fill for this, um, so I'm just going to show you one of, uh, that are in the docs. So essentially, uh, here we have this, this uh, gray rectangle. And um, notice how there's this class here defined called big blue, uh, which is es essentially the same, the same squ uh, square. It's the same square, um, except its background color is not gray. It's, it's, a, it's, a blue, um, it's a blue square. And so basically, if you look at this jQuery script, you can see that when I click on uh, any div, and by the way, this is uh, a div. When I click on any div, I'm going to add the class big blue uh, to that div. And here's some extra arguments, too, that um, you don't necessarily need to know, or you can look in the, in the documentation to find out what they mean. But essentially, it's going to, I want to do it over the course of 1,000 milliseconds or one second. Uh, and I also want this sort of special predefined ease out and bounce uh, effect. And so that's what this, this looks like. So notice how upon clicking on it, it became bigger um, to, to the specified class. Um, the, all, the, all the class properties in there. Um, it, it did it over the course of a second, and it also had this sort of ease out and bounce effect. So that's, uh, that's adding a class. Notice how it was only like three lines of jQuery, two or, or, you know, two or three, but um, it was all really defined in the, in the CSS. That's where all of that really happened. Anyway, <coughs> so we've gone over so far, you know, getting and setting content. We've also looked at the effects, but now we're going to look at uh, how you can listen for those effects. So again, everything on the page, uh, from, from the very loading of the page to the user interacting with the page, is an event. Um, so that goes from the very beginning. Uh, right when a person puts in uh, google.com, they, they send a request to Google servers that I want to fetch all of that, all that stuff. All the, all everything that, that comprises Google.com, so all the HTML and CSS and such. 
Uh, that comes back over. Uh, and when that page is finished loading, it sends the first event of the page. And that first event is the document is ready. So that's why we had that, that document.ready syntax in the beginning. It's just to say, like, I'm ready. Now what do you want me to run? And there's a bunch of other stuff that you can run from there. <coughs> um, and so dot ready is really the first thing you're listening for. And right when that uh, is responded to with, a, with an affirmative, with a yes, then you can listen for other things and execute all the other jQuery functions. Uh, the response to clicks and key presses, too, uh, scrolling and hovering, et cetera. <coughs> so uh, we, already we already showed you like dot click, but essentially um, the way it looks is that upon dot click, you, you execute the function within the parentheses thereafter. So notice how uh, after dot click, it actually starts with function and then, uh, and then traditional jQuery code. Um, Everything in jQuery really is just executing the functions that follow thereafter. And this is no different. So essentially, if you had like a button that's like a You're Awesome button, then um, this is what that code would look like. It would just listen for a click on that ID. And when that is clicked, do. It would just do an alert. Likewise, you can also hover over things if you want um, certain things to pop up, for instance. So I don't know, if you're, if you're doing, um, if you're doing like photos and, and you want to have like text to come up after you hover over them, um, essentially the way you would do that is that you have you have the um, you you could do it in, in a way that like the text is is uh, is below and then upon hovering it you can move it up over the photo as an overlay, um, and so in this case um, yeah in this case we have an element bo box and then upon um, Upon hovering over it, we add active box to, to the body. Is that all clear? Does, is there anyone, uh, does anyone have any questions about, about uh, these? Yeah. Is, is active box um, linked to your CSS file, or is that a jQuery function? Great question. So is active box um, part of the jQuery, or is it part of the CSS? It's part of the CSS. So somewhere in my CSS, I've defined this class called active box. So it's dot active box, and then uh, some, some number of properties, and then all I've done is like to the body of, of the HTML, I've added that. <coughs> um, also, there's also, last but not least, there's also um, scrolling. So this happens basically as, whenever the user is scrolling, this function fires. Uh, and whenever the user is not scrolling, it just, it stops firing. And so, um, can anyone tell me what this might do? We can also sort of break it down into from jQuery into English if that helps. But um, basically, oh, notice how this one, uh, this uh, selector at the top there is window and does not have quotes because you can always access the window. In other words, basically the entire the entire page. Like if someone's uh, scrolling the window, then that fires that function, uh, and that function is to make this this monster, which would presumably display none, to be display block. In other words, show up. Um, and then when, when the user stops scrolling, you can fade out at, over the course of a second. Question? So if you have some other ID that's scroll, is that only going to scroll within that element? Or is, it, like, is that going to overwrite the window scroll? Or Great question. So if, instead of uh, doing it on window, if you did it on a particular ID, um, you have to make sure that the ID is scrollable in the first place. So if you have like a really small sort of you know, 50 pixel by 50 pixel um, um, element, then there's no scrolling that's actually going to happen, and so really it's a sort of it sort of won't happen at all. Only when you have something that that is large enough at any point, so that I don't know, maybe like either without um, messing with the window size, like it's it's scrollable. Only then will it work. So basically, you can't you can't scroll things that aren't scrollable. Is like another way of putting it. Okay, I sort of went through that. Um, Kind of fast, and I believe, um, yeah, I believe I'm finished. But um, does anyone have any questions about jQuery? I just want to sort of drive home that that um, nothing is super different. It's really all about knowing what you want to select, which is what we talked extensively about in CSS, and then attaching to it various functions that do the behavior that you want them to do. And that behavior uh, can be in the form of of um, you know 
fading in, fading out, um, adding CSS properties that you previously weren't there in the beginning, but only after you do something do you want them to be there. Um, uh, and, and they can react to basically anything that happens on a page, like clicking, hovering, scrolling, um, and keyboard presses too, which will be in the hands-on. But I hope that's, that's clear. Because I can't go over all of jQuery with the time that we have, but I can tell you in general that's what jQuery is. Yeah? Are all um, jQuery functions void functions? They're not ever taken as parameters? So um, the, que uh, the question is, are all jQuery functions void functions? Uh, they're, they're void functions in that they don't, um, well, some of them return J other jQuery objects. So um, um, all you really have to know is that they do take in parameters, as we saw, like fade in, for example, does take in you know, how, how long you want to take it to take. Uh, but um, in general, they do return things in the sense that if you added multiple methods, so instead of just doing dot fade in, you can actually do dot other things too. Um, and essentially, what's returned by one is acted upon by another. Um, so it wouldn't be void, because that would, that would be like, um, I don't know what to act on. It's still the same jQuery object. Yeah. OK. Question? How much larger would it be to do this in plain JavaScript as opposed to using jQuery? Um, it'd, be, uh, it'd be pretty a lot larger. <laughs> it would be um, like, just, just to get one ID. In, in JavaScript, by the way, which is not, which is not general like, like it is in jQuery, which is really nice because you can put in a class in there, an ID, and the syntax is the same. You literally have to do get element by ID um, and get element by class uh, or just like it's super long and then, um, yeah, it just doesn't look as good at all. It'd be a lot longer. <laughs> yeah. Question? Um, so that, I believe that really depends on like what, what you've uh, told it to do. So um, basically, if you've told it to, um, if you told it to like add a class or something, the class I believe stays, and you actually literally have to specify a sort of remove class at the end of your hover, um, so that everything that you added is also removed, because that's most likely what you want to do. What, what about that thing where you're making the box like expand and change colors? Mm -hmm. So in that case, uh, it actually wouldn't. Because um, basically, if we look at the code, uh, all we told it to do is that upon clicking it, we want to give it this class, which is all the stuff there. So when I click it, you know, this happens. But I haven't said anything for clicking it again to make it go back, in case that's what you wanted it to do. So in this case, as much as I click, it won't go back. Yeah, good question. So yeah, that al that's also another concern. Like While you're writing this stuff, make sure that if you want it to revert back to how it was, you can look into. Um, ways that you can revert what you did. There's also a dot toggle in jQuery too. Toggling meaning, you know, click it once, it does something, click it again, it does another thing, and so on and so forth. Yeah? If I had a command that opened a window, and then to close it, I wanted to click outside that window, how would I do that? How do, how do you select everything but the pop-up window? Okay. Um, so if you, if you like had a div that came up, uh, and you want to select everything outside of it, um, really, it's just I guess how you organize your pop-up. So like if like there's content in the middle and you, there's also an outer div, then you could just say like click the outer div, um, and that should work. <coughs> yeah, we can. We'll definitely go over um, like really concrete examples in the next in the next lecture. Like I really want to go over really common things like modals um, and like how you make pop-up menus work. Uh, so yeah, that'll that'll probably happen by next lecture. Okay, all right. I think I have to hand it over to. Filling out them right now, and they're basically going to do everything uh, in practice. Okay. Hi everyone. So for today's hands-on, we made a little website. Uh, it's it's called Amazon. It's a marketplace. <laughs> And so uh, right now, if you look at our, our page, if you try clicking on the sign up button, nothing happens. 
And so our first task is to make, uh, to display a message when the user clicks on sign up. So notice how we have the document already. As Andy mentioned, we need that so that it starts loading the JavaScript only after uh, we loaded the whole HTML and CSS. So right now, when we click on the sign up button, which has an ID of, yeah, let's look. Yeah, so the ID is sign up button. All right, so the way we select that button is we do a dollar sign, and then however we would select it in CSS, which is hashtag sign up button. And then whenever we click on that, we want something to happen. So we're going to use the click function. And so when we click on the sign up button, we want to pop up a message. So we're going to use an alert for that. So this alert, thank you for on Amazon. <laughs> all right, so our next task is um, when we click on the sign up button, we want to make all the input fields uh, green. Like we want to change their border color. So if you look in our CSS, we have this class called filled in that we made, and it basically changes the border to a green border. So we're going to use the add class to add the, the filled in class to all of the input fields. So inside our Click function, we're going to select all the inputs as we would in, in CSS, which is just write, writing input. And then we're going to add the class filled in. All right, so now if we click on the sign up button. Inspecting this thing. Sorry. Look at the console. So whenever you get an error in uh, jQuery, uh, it pops up on the console. And like right now it said uh, unexpected token. But uh, wait, what was the token? I try that. What was the the token problem? Maybe the commas in the. Mm, no. I don't know what's happening. It's really weird. Yeah, <laughs> 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 All right. So I didn't like Hamzalicious for some reason, but <laughs> I guess we're just gonna keep. Thank you. So notice how the input boxes all became green, and you actu if actually, if you inspect them, you're gonna no notice that it added the class field of them. Um, so yeah, class filled in. So the next thing we're going to do is whenever we hover over the Amazon logo, we're going to remove the green borders. We're going to make them how they were before. So the way we're going to do that is by using the remove class. And then so whenever you hover over the 
Amazon logo, which has the ID of Amazon, you remove the class filled in oh, from the inputs, yeah. And remove the class. Are any questions so far? All right. So the next thing we're going to do is um, whenever we press the enter key, we want it to click the sign up button. So the way we're going to do that is by using the key down function. We want, want it to be so that whenever the user clicks the enter key, whether they're on the field is going to work. So we're going to do that for the document. document. Yeah. Document. Yeah. So document that key down. And uh, we're going to pass in a the object in our function. And we're going to explain it later on why we're doing that. But right now, right now we're going to name the parameter E. And this object, like, uh, it has the information of which key we pressed. And we only want, we wanted to click the sign up button whenever the enter key is pressed. And the way we're going to check for that is there's this attribute called key code. So if you do e.keycode, it's going to tell you which key the user pressed. And the number 13 corresponds to the enter key. So if the key code is 13, which basically means if the user pressed the enter key, we want to click the sign up button. Yeah, and it's a generally a good idea to put comments in your code. So whenever you're looking at it later on, you can see what's happening. All right, so let's test this out, see if it works. The enter. All right. That makes sense for everyone. Like, so instead of clicking sign up this time, um, in here we clicked enter, and it it checked that the key code was 13, and it called this function quick that we defined up here. All right. So the last thing we want to do is. Hard question. Yeah, you you have to look it up. Yeah. Other questions? All right. So the last thing we're going to do is we're going to display the user's password on the sign up page. And <laughs> so in our key down function, we're going to, if the if the user presses the enter key, we're going to show how much space. We have the picture. Right now it's uh, display none. So we're going to use the show function, which uh, removes the display none. And then we're going to get the password from the password field. So the password field has an ID of password input. And so if we, do and if we select the password input and then we do that val, whatever the user typed in the password. Let's save the password in a variable so we can use it. All right, so now that we have the user's password, password, we're just going to put that inside of, our, of a div we already made, which is called leaked password. And so we're going to use, well, we could use uh, text or HTML. Or yeah, we could use any of them to put the password inside of that, that div. We're going to do uh, hashtag lead password dot text. And then we're going to add the password. But we want to show the password. But first of all, we want to say, like, your password is. So we're going to do your password is. And then we're going to add the password to that. This is similar to what you did on your homework, the string uh, concatenation. Just on a side note, uh, I think if you don't put anything in text, it just grabs the value. But 
since we're feeding it in this string, this text, it will set that value instead. Yeah. Uh, let's see what that looks. We'll type in a password. So yeah. Any questions? So I think someone had a question of um, like if the va if it like persists or something like the value. So if I keep typing in, it doesn't. But then if I um, since these are all listening, once I push enter again, then um, this will change. All right, that's it for today, guys.
Hey guys, uh, we're still waiting on someone to bring the plates. If you don't care, there's pizza in the back. Um, if you do care, you can wait for plates. All right, hi guys. I know I'm not Sean, uh, but uh, Sean's away this week. He's at, apparently he's at some event with uh, Tomas, so Tomas not here either. And so I'm sort of covering up for Sean, but at the same time, uh, I really like this topic of responsive design. Uh, it's a topic that I, that it's, a, it's a thing that I usually mess around with a lot when I'm designing my website. So for example, I start with my website and then I, I, just, I just stop and I'll just make it more responsive even though it's not even done. Uh, it's just a really fun thing to do and I think it's cool for me to teach it. So what you'll learn today is basically you'll learn how to make devices that work on all browsers and on all devices. Uh, uh, learn how to make websites that work on all browsers and on all devices. So let's talk a little bit about, about the state of the internet today in 2014. So almost 3 billion people have access to the internet. And if you think about it, that's, a, that's an insane number of people, right? So almost anyone across the globe can access your website, about 3 billion people. Um, and internet is not, not only accessible from all kinds of places, it's accessible, accessible from all kinds of devices, hey including laptops, hey desktops, uh, tablets, smartphones, and even your game consoles today. If you think about it, like the PS4, the Xbox One, you can actually view your website from there. And to think about it, that's actually pretty crazy. Uh, and we're entering the post-PC era. So what that means is basically, we're entering an era where people are moving away from buying like desktops and laptops and are more interested in buying things like tablets and mobile phones. So this is a graph of the desktop usage versus the mobile usage. And as you can see, back in 2007, when the uh, iPhone or the smartphones were first introduced, a desktop was clearly used much more than mobile phones. Obviously, that makes sense. It was just it was new back then, right? But then over time, it, it was predicted that in 2014, mobile usage would actually take over desktop usage. So people would be using mobile more than using desktops. And people thought that this would happen actually at the end of 2014. But this actually already happened in February, which is actually pretty crazy, right? This mobile phones are just being used so much more often. And it happened so early in the year, much earlier than anyone predicted. So we need to wonder, like, why am I telling you this? Well, this matters a lot for designers, because we need to make sure our websites work on all devices and on all browsers. So as, you, as I just showed you, there are so many more, more users on mobile than on, all, than on web. And so we need to make sure that everyone on the mobile can actually view our website. So you might be wondering, why won't my website work on all devices, right? I mean, you, you coded it. It looks fine on your computer. Why won't it look good on a mobile phone? What's, what's wrong with that? 
Well, just take a look at this example here. So you have a 1280 pixel screen, right? Which is uh, about the standard uh, MacBook or something like that. And then you have these three boxes, which are 300 pixels each. Uh, and they're all happy cats right now, right? Everyone is visible on this, on, this, on this desktop. So just imagine what would happen if you view this website on a mobile phone. Well, this is what would happen. <laughs> so you're going to have two grumpy cats, right? Two gr cats that can't be viewed on this mobile phone because your screen is only 300 pixels wide, and therefore only one box can fit on that screen, right? So it just makes sense. So we need to accommodate for this, and we need to change our design accordingly. So basically, why will my website works on all devices? It's basically because website, I mean, different devices come with different screen sizes and different rendering engines. And we're going to talk more about what rendering engines are later. And so content de designed for a laptop won't necessarily look the same on a mobile phone, and that's because you have less screen space, right? So you need to adjust your, de your design accordingly. Does anyone have any questions so far? Yeah. Why are we using pixels as measurements? Because I feel like, like now we have like retina display and high DPI screens. Mm. So is pixel even a good measurement anymore? Yeah, that's actually. Is it even pixel or is it some other? Is it like a yeah. virtual pixel? Uh, I'm not sure if, if what kind of a pixel it is, but basically what I mean by pixel is kind of like this, this it's, like, it's like a screen size. So when I say screen resolution and screen, and screen size, I'm kind of using them interchangeably. So basically it's just a measurement of size. So if, if you have a retina display, I, I don't I mean it for it to change the number of pixels. So basically it's just the same thing. Okay. Yeah. All right, so in order to uh, accommodate for our design changes when we go from mobile, uh, from desktop to mobile, uh, this gave birth to the, to the uh, terminology called responsive web design, which is basically designing your website in such a way that every user at every screen size has an optimal user, uh, visual experience. And this is important. So responsive de design doesn't only deal with screen sizes and like shrinking and having to deal with smaller sizes versus bigger sizes, but also has to do with other issues such as browser compatibility. As you guys probably know, like IE, everything goes wrong. Uh, even, even Safari versus Chrome, things go wrong there. So we need to fix for that. And finally, mobile compatibility. And mobile compatibility, what I mean by that is not necessarily just the size. I also mean, like for example, if you have a button on a desktop versus a button on a mobile, what should you change uh, in terms of that? And we will, we will be exploring each of these aspects today in more detail. So the issue number one, which is the simplest issue, is browser compatibility. So basically what browser compatibility means is the ability of each website to act as you expect it on each browser. So just because I Internet Explorer might not support certain features, it doesn't mean your website is not browser compatible if it works as you expect it on Internet Explorer. Does that make sense? Uh, so unfortunately, this issue is very annoying, but it's also very simple to deal with, right? Uh, and the reason why this happens is because different browsers have different rendering engines. So what that means is it has each browser has this component called a rendering engine, which basically takes your HTML and your CSS and displays it onto the screen. So obviously, if each browser has a different rendering engine, then your uh, website's going to look different on these different browsers, right? So take a look at this example of even something as simple as a, a dotted border, right? Like, why can't all websites just agree on what a dotted border should look, should look like? Why does IE7 have this diamond-shaped dotted border and why does uh, Firefox have a, a circular dotted border, whereas Chrome has a square dotted border, right? Why can't they just all be the same? And so you guys can see from this example that even something such, so simple as this causes such a big problem. So just imagine what, we would, what kind of problem would be created by like, bigger things. So this is a graph of the browser market share in 2014. Uh, so Chrome is regarded to be the, the, most, the fastest web browser with the best performance levels. So obviously, it has the most users. About 50% of users like to use Chrome over any other browser. And then comes IE, because as you guys know, like in other parts of the world, IE is still a very dominant browser that most people use. And then Firefox, followed by Safari, Opera, and then we have other browsers. All right, so now let's just talk about the makers of the browsers and the rendering engines of the browsers. So we have this rendering engine called WebKit. And Chrome, Safari, and Opera use WebKit as their rendering engine. So basically, if you design a website on Chrome, it's most likely going to look pretty good on Safari and Opera, and that's because they share the same rendering engine, and it's going to interpret your code the same way, right? 
So the differences between these two browsers rely mostly on other components of the browser, so basically not the rendering engine. So if you see a difference between Safari and Chrome, you're you most likely going to attribute that to like, other components of the browser. And then we have Firefox. And Firefox uses this rendering engine called Gecko. Uh, it renders HTML just like WebKit browser, so you don't have to worry about that. But it does have differences in terms of CSS. And so you, you, when you have code on your, uh, in your CSS, right, so things like width, like height, uh, maybe even like border, uh, the border width, for example, those kind of differences won't really make a difference between all your different browsers. But things like transitions, things like uh, transformations, animations, basically, those kind of things, you will actually notice a difference between all these three browsers, right? So for those kind of uh, CSS styles, you're going to need to add these things called vendor prefixes. So what vendor prefix prefixes are, are basically um, things that you add before certain CSS attributes in order to basically specialize for that kind of browser. So if you add a WebKit uh, prefix, that CSS property is going to apply just to WebKit browsers. And similarly, if you add a Moz prefix, that prefix is going to apply just to Moz uh, browsers. So for example, if you wanted to add a transition to your, uh, I don't know, to your div or something, you'd add the, for a WebKit browser, you'd add the prefix WebKit. And for example, that would be dash WebKit dash transition and then 0 0.2 seconds. So that would be a, a transition specialized just for WebKit browsers that would only be evaluated by WebKit browsers. And similarly, if you do that for Moz, you do dash Moz dash transition and then 0 0.2 seconds, and that would be just for Moz browsers. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, so if you just do transition by itself, that's basically like the, the default, the, the last resort. So if you do just transition, that's where the differences happen. So basically, transition is used in case WebKit for some reason doesn't work or for, or if for some reason Moz doesn't work. So it's a good idea to have all of these listed. Uh, and I'll show you that just now in a, in a slide. Uh, tr the regular transition is used by Internet Explorer. So for example, this is what it would look like if you were to make your uh, div browser compatible, you'd have to add the transition for all different browsers. So you'd have dash WebKit, dash transition, and then similarly Moz, and similar for O, and then just the last one, transition, which is what you just asked about. And the last one would be the last resort, or just for uh, Internet Explorer. And you actually don't need to have the O one anymore, because uh, like I just said, uh, Opera just, got re just recently changed their uh, rendering engine to WebKit. So you can just add WebKit, and it'll work on Opera too. So Internet Explorer causes the most problems in terms of browser compatibility. I'm not going to go through each of the individual problems with each uh, single version, because that's just too many things to deal with. You guys can read, it, read this on your own. Uh, but basically, to solve these problems, all you need to do is add conditional comments. So what conditional comments are, they're basically comments that you add in your head tag that only get evaluated if you're using a certain browser. right? So Microsoft is the one that invented this. They rolled it out for developers, so developers can use it. You just basically add these conditional comment blocks in your head tag, and they'll only get evaluated if you're on a certain browser. So for example, if you're using IE7, and you as a developer, you wanted to add some specific CSS style just for IE, uh, IE7, then you add this comment. So you do open uh, thing, <laughs> exclamation mark, and then if IE7, and then you add the code between that block. And this is useful, for example, if you wanted to use a specialized uh, CSS style sheet just for IE7, you'd add the link inside there, and it'd only get evaluated if you're using IE7. Does that make sense, everyone? And other examples, you'd, you'd be like, if you just want to use it for all Internet Explorer browsers, you just say if IE. And if you wanted to do it for IE9 and below, you just say if less than or equal to IE9, uh, it would get evaluated. Does anyone have any questions on that? So these go in your head tag, and yeah. Basically, you, you just use specialized CSS style sheets. All right, so now we're done with the issue number one. It's basically prefixes and the conditional comments. But now we're down to issue number two, which is screen resolutions. So just to recap, not all your viewers will view your website with the same screen size, right? So for take, for example, a 15-inch MacBook Pro versus a 13-inch MacBook Pro. There are obviously different sizes, so not everyone's going to view your website on the same screen size. And you can actually also notice this difference when you just shrink your browser. We actually got a question about this today, which is like, why is my top bar getting screwed up when I shrink my browser? And then, well, the answer is because of this. It's basically about mobile responsiveness. So you need to actually accommodate for that, and you need to make, make design changes for that. 
these are the top four screen resolutions of 2014. It was actually, it's actually been moving more towards the left, towards 1366 by 768. Re uh, in the last semester, we actually taught that 1024 was the most popular, but that's ha that has changed recently. So this one right here, oh, never mind. 1366 by 768 is the most popular, followed by the others. So, and this is important for us because we can actually use this screen size to design our website. So what that means is um, we can have containers that are a fixed width. And by setting that fixed width, we know that most browsers will be using this width, and therefore, they should have a good viewing experience. So you use containers to make your content fit a certain size. So you'd wrap all your content in this container. And then you'd set it to be uh, 1024 by 768, so 1024 pixels wide. And the reason why we chose that, like I said, it was the smallest, most popular screen size. Uh, and when we do this, we want to focus on our content and not on our screen size. So we, we don't want to ma make our browser be a certain size and just try to fit everything in there. We'd rather focus on our content, try to organize it in such a way that it looks good on that screen size. So everyone using, your, uh, using a, uh, a device with a screen size that's greater than 1024 will have a good viewing experience for the same reason, as I just said is that they'd be able to view that and more. So basically, whatever left over would be just for white space. So you might be wondering, well, what about users with, with lower screen sizes, right? So we're going to introduce CSS media queries. So this is what I was talking about earlier. This is my favorite thing to do on CSS, to just make my website mobile responsive for, the, for fun, basically. And this will allow you to build websites that are viewable on mobile as well. So CSS media queries, they allow you to use different CSS depending on the uh, screen resolution of the, the user. And the way you define this is you say, at media, and then you specify a query, and then you add the CSS inside that, query, inside that uh, block of code. So at media, which is a media, declaration, media query declaration, and then you have your query in, inside the brackets. So if you wanted to query whether the user has a browser, browser width that's greater than 1,500 pixels, you'd say max width 1,500 pixels. Or in this case, if you want to check if they have a browser width that's at most 1,024 pixels, you'd say a max width 1,024 pixels. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions? Yes. So if you like, so if you for a tablet and a phone, you know how they're different sizes? Yeah. Are you going to redo like your whole code just to fit those different sizes? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you won't actually have to re redo your entire code. You basically have to change certain things that will make it look good on that browser. So basically, what you have to do is you have to design your code in such a way that you only have to make certain changes. It's kind of a, a tricky thing to discuss. But like, you don't want to use position absolutes everywhere, because then when you shrink your browser, you're going to have to change all the positioning for every single element, right? So that's one reason why you shouldn't use position absolute everywhere. But basically, you just need to change certain st uh, attributes that will reorganize your code. For example, if you had boxes that were stacked horizontally, you just Instead of floating them horizontally, you just stack them vertically, and that'll make all your code just stack vertically. Yeah. Would you refer to like the same classes and IDs? Like same, like going back to your HTML, it's still the same. You're just changing your CSS. Right? Yeah, you're just changing your CSS with CSS media queries. Does anyone have any other questions? Yeah. What would change if you decided to separate? Uh, well, for example, if you had two boxes that were 50% each. And just imagine you shrunk that just to this, this wide. Then you'd have really small boxes, and it wouldn't look as good. You're right. It wouldn't break necessarily or, or anything malfunction. But you just want to have them stacked vertically so that you can maximize your width and just make use of it. Does anyone have any other questions? All right. So now I have a no, never mind. <laughs> uh, there's another way that you can actually use media queries. This is just directly in the head tag. So instead of having this block of code at the end of your uh, CSS document, you can just have your media queries right in your head tag. So when you have the other one that I just talked about, the media, when you declare it this way, you're going you're gonna to want to add this media query at the end of your CSS document. Can anyone tell me why you want to do that? It's written on the slide. <laughs> it's basically so that you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you want to override. Basically, what you're doing with CSS media attributes is you're overriding your older CSS, right? So if you had things stacked horizontally, you'd stack them vertically. So you're just overriding that kind of uh, positioning. Uh, so you want to add this at the end of your CSS so that you can do that, and that your code overrides what it was written before. And you can also add this directly in your link tag. So you say link rel stylesheet, 
media, and then you specify your query within quotation marks, and then just regularly you specify the address. Yeah, question. So if you're overriding all of your other stuff, then does it keep everything that you've been overriding? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so if you're, he asked if you're overriding your CSS, does it keep everything that's not overridden? And the answer to that question is yes. So for example, if you had a background color of red on your div, and then when you have a certain width you want it to, to I don't know, float left or something, your, back, your, your div would still be red, but it would be floated to the left. Yeah. So this is just, uh, yeah, sorry, question. Yeah, so like, uh, what's like the best way to test this? Just because like, we know if you're doing it on like your laptop, you can just like, uh, you can just like open up your browser or something. But then like, how do I like push it to my iPhone? Or do you need to like, change the browser? So is your question like, how do I see what my website looks like on other sizes? Right. Yeah, we're going to go, I'm actually going to go over that at the end. You'll actually see like a very specific example of how to test it, okay. and I'll show you guys. Question? Uh, what if you design your website first for the mobile? Oh, so you want to go the other way? Yeah. I mean, it would work the same way, just that you just say min width. Like, for example, instead of saying max width, you just say min width, and then you specify certain attributes that way. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. So I have a question for you now. So can we use media queries to modify HTML? Does anyone have an answer? You want to guess? It's only yes or no. <laughs> yes. Uh, the answer <laughs> is is no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so CSS media queries are strictly for CSS, <laughs> but you can actually change your HTML using JavaScript. And Sean taught me this trick this semester. Actually, I didn't I didn't know about it, but it's qu it's quite tricky, and I don't think it would be worth the time to explain that. <laughs> but it is possible. So this is what. Uh, medium, which is, I'm sure you guys have heard of it a lot from Sean. Uh, this is what medium looks like when you have a browser width that's greater than a thousand pixels. So they have this image stacked on the left and then they have their blog post on the right. But then look how it changes when you have a browser width that's less than a thousand pixels but greater than 500 pixels. So instead of having the image on the left, now they push that image to the top and they put the, the articles on the bottom. So the reason why they do this is because, oh sorry, as, as you can see here, the image is kind of getting narrow and narrow. So if you're going to shrink that even more, it's going to look too narrow. And so they want to push it on the top so you give it enough space. And then finally, their mobile version looks like this. It's sort of the same thing, just that everything's smaller. Yeah. yeah, is there another question? Oh, sorry. All right, so we're moving on to our issue number three, which is mobile compatibility. So this is not the same as just shrinking your browser. This is actually like dealing with issues like the size of buttons and things like that. So UIs for mobiles are quite different than those for desktop. As you've probably noticed, like if you open up an application like Facebook on your phone, it looks completely different than Facebook on uh, the web, right? For example, on Facebook on the web, you'd have your, your, your chat bar on the side. You'd have the trending things. You'd have lots, lots of other ads and things like that. But on your phone, it's just strictly your news feed and then a couple of buttons here and there. So they differ in these three main ways, which is screen size, and then touchscreen capabilities, and performance. And we're going to talk about each of these issues in more detail right now. So before we do that, though, we're going to look at this mobile versus desktop chart. So in terms of screen size, you have a mobile is basically about 3.5 to 5.5 inches wide. And then on desktop, you'd have 11 inches to 30 inches wide. As you can, as you can tell, desktops are much bigger than mobile phones. And then in terms of input method, touchscreen on mobile, and we generally don't have touchscreen on uh, desktops, and we have mouses. In terms of performance, mobiles are much slower than desktops. It makes a lot of sense. Desktops are much, much more powerful. So in order to deal with our issue number one, which is screen size, we need to take into account that the fact that mobiles are much smaller. So we need to focus on our content and tuck everything else away. So that's what Facebook did with their design, is that they tucked away the, new, the trending stuff, they tucked away the, cha the chat bar, they put everything aside, and they just focus on the news feed, because they don't have enough space to fit all that on one screen, right? And additionally, you need to restrict your use of position fixed elements. Can anyone tell me why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there simply isn't enough room for position fixed elements, right? You can't have a, you have a top bar, but you can't have a top bar and another box and a search box or something like that, right? There just isn't enough room for all those kind of things. And people ask the question about stacking things horizontally and using 50% width on each. It would still work on mobile, but you just won't have enough space to fit that all and give enough, give enough emphasis to each particular uh, element. So that's why 
UIs that are on mobile usually go for vertical, vertical stacks rather than horizontally stacked. And this helps maximize the width of each element. So issue number two is touchscreen versus mouse. So obviously touchscreens, I mean, so obviously mouses have much more pre precision where you can just click on very small things on the, on the website. But on a phone, you can't do that, right? You only have your thumb to click things in most general cases. So you need to change your uh, UI elements on mobile to accommodate for this kind of difference. So basically, you need to add more padding using CSS media queries. Uh, and also, you guys know how on the iPhone 6 or 6 Plus, they have this thing called reachability, which basically moves all their content down just so you can reach it. So similarly, you might want to think about where you place your buttons on a mobile, right? You don't want to put them all the way on the top if they're going to be frequently used, because then the user is going to have to go all the way to the top and click it every single time. So you can actually use the bottom of the uh, UI to put your buttons there. And it's different on a desktop. We usually said that putting things on the bottom gives it less emphasis, but on mobile, it gives it more emphasis. And issue number three is performance. So performance of mobile is generally about half of that of the desktop. Uh, this causes mobile websites to be slow. So if you're going to have transitions, animations, transformations, things going on in, on your desktop version of your mobile, you might want to just get rid of those altogether on your, mo on your, on your mobile version of your website, because they're just, they're just much slower, and those animations aren't going to render as smoothly as, as they would on a desktop. So you want to minimize your use of heavy manipulations using JavaScript and jQuery. So like Adam and Phil just showed you that you can click on things, you can hover on things, but you might want to just minimize those altogether when you're using that for mobile. Again, minimize use of transitions and animations. And basically, your mobile UI should just be as simple as click and scroll, right? You don't want users to have to like, hover over, I mean, slide over things and just do all these crazy things. You just want to have them scroll and click on whatever they want to see. All right. Does anyone have any questions? All right, I'm going to show you guys a demo of how to actually test your browser against all these different sizes, which is what a student asked me before. So we're going to take a look at this website. Uh, all right, it's kind of cut off on the side, but that's OK. So this is what it looks like right now. And we can inspect element. So you guys might want to do this on any website. Why isn't my right click working? Oh, there. OK. So right click, inspect element. And this is just a regular web inspector, nothing different. But in or if we want to test it on different screen sizes, we can actually go ahead and click this mobile button in the top left corner. And if you do that, you'll automatically notice that you have these grids on the left, uh, on the top and on the left. Let me get rid of this box here. Yeah, so you have this, these grids on the top left and, and on the uh, top and on the left. And these are basically the screen sizes of your, of your UI. So it goes from 100 to 200 all the way to 1,800. And you can basically test your website against any size using this. So if you go to your web inspector and you click on emulation at the bottom. Can you move it over? Move what over? Oh, it's because you can't see it. Oh, sorry. OK. OK. So if you go to your web inspector and you click on emula emulation at the bottom, you can choose any kind of mobile phone or whatever you want to test it against. So you can choose an Amazon Kindle, an Apple iPad, an iPhone, whatever. So for the purposes of this, let's first go with, let's say, like an, a tablet, right? So right now we're, we're reviewing it on an iPhone. Let's go to the tablet first. So let's say an iPad 3 or whatever that is. So this is what it would, it would look like on an iPad. Sorry, let me just first show you what it would look like on a regular one. So on the regular one, it, was, it looks like this. And then they have these things here where you can actually hover. Oh. You can actually hover over these ones. But then once, once you, sh you shrink your browser size a bit, you notice that it's no longer hoverable. It's just automatically displaying the text that would have been displayed if you did hover over it. And then if you want to go even smaller, you can change that to an iPhone 5. And then you'll see what it looks like on an iPhone 5. So you, you might want to do this for a couple of uh, popular websites and just look at the kind of design choices that they made when they changed the size of the browser. So if you notice for this one, they first had this text much bigger and a little bit higher than it is right now. 
But now because it's on a mobile and you want to have your button at the bottom, they push it down. And they, instead of going for the uh, typical nav bar with like a home and whatever on, on top, they just went for this hamburger I icon on the top. Does anyone have any questions about the web inspector? All right, so we're going to go around and show you the lorem ipsum word of the week, Phil and I think and Sarah. All right. All right, so in review, you want to design your, your mobile. You want to design for mobile because that's ever so important in this day and age. As you just saw from the graph, mobile users are, have eclipsed desktop users. So make sure your website also works on all browsers, and you can do that using prefixes and using conditional comments, and again, on all devices using media queries. So we're going to actually go ahead and do a hands-on now. I'll give you guys a, a couple of minutes break to get the word of the week down. So if you guys could go ahead and download this hands-on from uh, the portal, I uploaded it under lecture number nine. Does the portal change on your phone? It's not responsive. The portal isn't responsive, but it doesn't collapse. That, In this day and age, I think it's important. <laughs> Uh, that is true. We should we should tell that to Sean. <laughs> yeah, you can access the portal on your phone. That's true, but it it you can't. Oh yeah 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 yeah. There's no button, but if you actually just hard code the link, you could actually access it. Yeah. <laughs> Sean made it, not me. <laughs> just kidding. But you can actually view it on your phone. But the portal it doesn't change if you're on the phone. It, so what I've taught you here today is how to change your, your code accordingly using media queries and other things like that. But the portal, he just set a max width so that it doesn't change any further if you shrink it anymore. So does anyone need more time to download the hands-on? Does, does anyone have it opened up? I got some, we got some feedback saying that the hands-on were a bit too rushed. So we're trying to take this slow. Hopefully everyone has it open by now. All right, I'm going to get started. So we have this basic website, nothing special going on. It's just a top bar. Uh, a picture, and then two paragraphs. Okay, so what's one thing you notice that's wrong about this website in terms of design? We've talked about this a lot. There's like unnecessary space above the bar. Oh, actually, this is getting. Oh. Sorry about that. Okay, well, it's supposed to fit, so that isn't the concern right now. Does anyone have any other suggestions? Well, one thing that I would say is that this content is just spanning the whole website from left to right, right? Remember how we talked about containers and setting a fixed width? Not, even, not only in this lecture, but in previous lectures too. So you want to have a fixed width so that your, your user can focus his eyes on the center of the website and not go have to read from all the way from left to right just to get all the information. So let's go ahead and do that. So in our uh, open up Web Inspector, and you notice uh, if you want to get rid of this, you just click on the mobile again. So you notice how there's a, a div called container, and all we need to do is to specify the specific container is just add a width. So we're going to set a max width of 960 pixels, and this automatically sh puts all the content in the center of the website, so it looks good. So why did I do that? Well, I did that because, first of all, 960 pixels is a, is a good viewing range. And also, anyone who's viewing this website on a, on, a, on a device with a greater screen size will have the same viewing experience, except he will have probably more, left, uh, more white space on the left and right, which is OK. I mean, it do, at least it doesn't crash, right? All right, so we've done that. But if you start shrinking this website even more, you notice how it starts to get very cluttered, right? First of all, the nav bar, you can't even read everything. And then the text boxes are just completely way too small. You really want to fix that, right? So the first change we're going to make is to the top bar itself. So one suggested idea would be to just put them on different levels. 
So right now they're stacked side by side, which looks good on a bigger browser. But on this kind of a browser, it doesn't look as good. So we're going to want to stack them horizontally. And the way we do that is we add a me media query. So I can't really do it in the Web Inspector. It gets kind of tricky. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it straight here. So you want to add this at the end of your CSS. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Is that good? OK. Is that good? So at the end of your, of your CSS style sheet, you want to add a media query. So you say at media, and then the query, which is max width. And let's say for the purposes of this demo, we want to set this to be a max width of 480 pixels, so basically for mobile. So 480 pixels. And as you can see, now it's red, and that means it's working. Uh, Sublime text has identified what it is. It's a media query declaration. And in order to stack those elements differently, you notice how in our regular example in our navbar, you notice how the, head is float the header is floated to the left, whereas the list is floated to the right. So to change that, we go ahead and add new style store header. So you do hashtag header. And instead of float right, you don't want it to float at all. You don't want it to float on the left or on the right, so you just say float none. And then we just want to add some spacing, so padding 20 pixels and then 0. So now you can see that it's a little bit too much space. We're going to get rid of that. But you can see that it's no longer stacked side by side. It's stacked on, they're stacked on top of each other. All right. So next, we want to change our nav bar. So you saw that there was too much space going on. So we want to style our nav bar and get rid of all that space. So we do hashtag nav bar and then padding 0, margin 0. And that gets rid of all, those, all that extra space that we had up there. Does anyone have any questions so far? OK. So next, does anyone have any suggestions as to what else we should do to the nav bar in terms of this thing right here? I mean, like I said before, when you have a mouse, it's easy to click on this. But when you have your, your thumb, it's not that easy to click on these three little uh, pieces of text that are so close to, ch to each other. So you want to space those out, maybe even make them just take up the whole width of your browser. So to do that, we would add our style to hashtag navbar and then to the unordered list, which contains all those list items. And we set the width to be 100%, so that it takes up the entire uh, width of the browser. And then you saw how it was floated to the right. Now we don't want to float it to the left or to the right, so we just say float none. And that'll override what was written before. All right. There's still one more change that we need to make, though is that we need to make sure that each list item is a display block. Because right now, it's display inline block, right? Because they're stacked side by side. So we want to change that to display block so that they're stacked horizontally. So we do a hashtag navbar, and then list items. No, I don't want to buy you. Display uh, block. And margin 0, because there was a margin to the left of 15 pixels. And then we want to give it a sort of a different background color so that it stands out from the rest. So we do background, hashtag, it's a random gray color. And then a margin bottom of 5 pixels. So now you can see that now we have our buttons. They're stacked vertically. Uh, sorry, yeah, stacked horizontally vertically. Uh, they have a different background color, and there's a little bit of spacing between each button. But there's still not enough padding, right? You still might accidentally click on About when you're trying to click on Home, or click on Buy when you're trying to click on About. So we want to add more padding to our navbar items. But we don't want to add it just to the navbar item. item. We want to add it to the entire anchor tag. So if you notice here, we have anchor tags inside of our list items. We want to make the whole thing clickable, right? And the anchor tag is what is clickable. So we want to add the padding to the anchor tag. So we do hashtag navbar and then a, which is for anchor tag. And then we, we set a padding of 10 pixels. And then we want to center the text inside it. So we do text align center. Oh. 
Yeah, sorry. And you also need to add display block. So it takes up the entire horizontal space. Yeah, question. So why don't you notice the thing that you tagged? Sorry? Why do you, why do you add a thing tag again? Okay. So we have this anchor tag inside of our list item. So we want to make sure that the tag itself is, is ha has that padding so we can click on the entire div, right? So you don't want to have a case where you, you click over here and the button doesn't actually get clicked because the anchor tag is just occupying the text. So you want the text, it's, I mean, the, the tag itself to be padded so that the whole thing is clickable. That's the general idea behind it. Does anyone have any other questions? Okay. So now we have our buttons. They look pretty good. Uh, they're stacked horizontally, they're clickable, they're big enough. Uh, we want to make some changes to our text, though. They're still stacked side by side, and we want to change that. So in order to change that, you'll notice that uh, each pr uh, paragraph has a class called content. So basically, all we need to do is set a new style to that content class. So we do dot .content, and then we set the width to be 100%, so it takes up the entire screen. And then we just add a padding bottom to separate the two paragraphs from each other of 20 pixels. And now you can see that they're automatically just stacked vertically. I mean, vertically, yes, vertically. <laughs> and it was as simple as just specifying the width to be 100% and setting a padding, padding to the bottom. Does everyone see that? So if you, st yeah, sorry, question. Uh, let's see. Let's test that. So you want to get rid of these, and you want to say display block. It actually doesn't do anything, and that's because you floated these elements. So floating overrides that, and you, and you specified a width to be 35%. Yeah, so even if you did display block, it still won't, won't take up the entire width of the, of the device. So yeah, like I was saying earlier, it's as simple as saying width 100% and then padding bottom. So it automatically pushes the other element to the bottom, and they're stacked vertically. Does anyone have any other questions? All right. And then uh, finally, what we want to do is we want to add a style to our container. You notice how on, on, on this website right now, it's kind of stuck to the side of the, website, of the browser. So we want to space that out a little bit. So we add a padding of 10 pixels to the container. And by doing that, we added a little bit of spacing here so it's not completely stuck to the side. So yeah, so in just using those, that, those uh, CSS styles, we've changed this entire layout of the website from being what it used to be to this. So uh, you'll notice as, though, a as you keep going, so we didn't specify any new styles for this kind of a size, right? Because it's still greater than 480 pixels. So nothing happens here yet. But as soon as we hit 480 pixels, it should be coming up soon. As you can see, I have this thing in the top right corner which tells you the size of the browser. So it's all right. There. Everything just changes all of a sudden. And that's really cool. So you can do this using CSS media queries. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, sorry, question. This would have been much harder if you had a bunch of absolutely positioned elements, because then you'd have to manually change each and every element's positioning, right? Because what position absolute does is it doesn't depend on any, any other element. So even if you set a width of 100% to one element, it doesn't mean that the other element is going to uh, like move away and stack under it, right? Because it's positioned absolute, it's sort of above it on a different level. Does anyone have any other questions? All right. So I think. That's all I had for today. You guys are dismissed early. Uh, just a second, though. <laughs> Do we have any announcements? Uh, yeah, so we'll hopefully send out the, the project, finding project specs soon. But other than that, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.